Utilizing their full questions. Question oral. The Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Mission. Mr. Speaker, nobody believes what the Prime Minister's chalet buddy has to say. David Johnston is a former member of the Trudeau Foundation. He's been trying to cover up Beijing's interference in order to strengthen and reestablish Canadians' trust in our democratic system. Will the Prime Minister finally fire his Trudeau Foundation buddy and launch a real public inquiry, yes or no? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition claims to want to know the facts. He claims that a public inquiry is the only way to learn the truth, but he is refusing to actually learn the truth when intelligence services are offering him a briefing to update him on all the facts, all of the intelligence underlying his concerns about foreign interference. And yet he is wholly refusing. He prefers ignorance so he can continue he can continue attacking our former governor general. It's really an all in act with this guy. What he wants what he says is there's nothing to see here, so why don't you come into a dark room and see it, and then we'll commit you to an oath of secrecy so you can walk out and tell Canadians that you can't tell them anything at all. <laughs> That's effectively what he's saying. We don't need more people to keep secrets. We need more people telling the truth. Yeah. Why won't you launch a public inquiry to do that? Yeah, yeah. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Position was Minister of Elections. Perhaps that is his approach, why he didn't do anything to fight foreign interference that was ongoing in our elections and has been for decades. Mr. Speaker, he chose to cover his ears and not listen uh, to intelligence officials. And now uh, he is not letting the facts get in the way of base partisan attacks. He is choosing to not get briefed up on the actual facts of the matter so that he can continue to attack attack our democracy, to attack other political parties, to attack esteemed individuals like our former Governor General. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Canadians need the facts. Everyday Canadians. They don't need to have just a Prime Minister keeping secrets and then have that same Prime Minister force other people to keep his secrets as well, Mr. Speaker. You know, this Prime Minister said he admires the basic Chinese yeah. communist dictatorship. Yeah. When will you realize that we live in Canada and you can't silence your critics? Yeah. The right honorable prime minister. Mr. Speaker. Uh, the leader of the opposition is entitled to his opinions. He's just not entitled to his facts. Uh, that's why the intelligence uh, community has offered, uh, and we actually directed uh, the intelligence community to give him uh, the clearance necessary so that he can find out all the facts, all the information necessary, and he is choosing to hide behind a veil of ignorance so that he doesn't have to get allow the facts to get in the way of a good political argument or personal attack, uh, either on me or on a former Governor General or on anyone who seems to stand in his way. Here, here. Uh, before we go to the next question, there's a lot of chattering going on, and I want to make sure that everyone gets to hear the questions and the answers. So I'm going to ask everyone, once again, take a deep breath and let's listen to both sides. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. He wants facts. Well, here's a fact. He would have me commit to following Section 12.1 of the National Security and Intelligence Committee Act, which would not only strip away my ability to speak about this matter, but would ban me from doing it right here on the floor of the House of Commons. That is a fact. The real question is, what is he so determined to hide? We know Beijing helped him in two elections. We know Beijing gave donations to his Trudeau Foundation. Is that why he's so determined to silence his critics and keep these secrets? Yeah. Right, Honourable Prime Minister. 
Speaker, I know it's difficult for some people to remember, but uh, the Honourable Member was at one point a Minister of the Crown and thereby uh, subject to oaths of secrecy and, uh, and Cabinet confidences and was able to handle secrets just fine at that point, including <laughs> when he was uh, Minister for Elections. At the same time, Mr. Speaker, he is choosing now to turn his back on the facts because the facts would be inconvenient That's to it. the political argument he's trying to make right now. If that, that, that member was serious about this serious issue, he would allow the intelligence agencies to give him the necessary brief. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. This Prime Minister is saying that nothing has been hidden. And yet, actually, come look at everything that's been hidden. And then you can go to the media and tell them, actually, I can't say anything. That's, that's it. No more information for Canadians, for citizens who are worried about losing the independence of our democratic system. When will this prime minister finally stop hiding behind his Trudeau Foundation friend and finally launch a public inquiry? The right honorable prime minister, Mr. Speaker. Once again, the leader of the opposition is showing that he has no understanding of how our security system works and what our responsibilities are as parliamentarians. For example, the Committee of Parliamentarians on Intelligence and Security see all of the information in full, and then later they draft reports that they share with Parliament to explain how they assess whether things were done right and whether they agree or not. That system already exists. So he's manufacturing reasons for him to remain in ignorance. The Honourable Member for Belle Chambly, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister is starting to look pretty alone. He doesn't have a lot of friends, apart from Mr. Johnston, of course. All the other parties want a public independent inquiry. The former chief electoral officer also wants that. Experts are asking for it. Even Morris Ros Rosenberg is asking for that inquiry, but not David Johnston. Who will the Prime Minister listen to? His buddy Johnston or his buddy Rosenberg? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we asked Mr. Johnston to carry out an in-depth analysis of all of the intelligence and the facts. He looked at the context. He looked at what Ensyra and Ensikop did. And he assessed whether a public inquiry would help to restore the public's trust. He ultimately concluded that, no, that is not the best way of proceeding. He will hold public hearings over the summer in order to hear from Canadians. But the public inquiry, in his opinion, is not necessary. The Honourable Member, appointing a former member of the Trudeau Foundation, a family friend and a friend of China, the appointment of that individual was not legitimate. The conclusions of the report are not legitimate. Mr. Johnston's stubbornness in self-designating himself to continue in this role is not legitimate. If Mr. Johnston refuses to recuse himself, as Parliament will probably ask him to, will this Prime Minister have the statesmanship and dignity to ensure that that happens and to ensure that a public inquiry is held? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, what's interesting here is to see that the leader of the Bloc Québécois who is so concerned about facts and legitimacy. What's interesting is that he is refusing to be briefed on the secret and confidential information that CSIS has accumulated on this. He is also refusing to accept the facts, to accept reality, in order to be able to continue with his partisan attacks. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. This Liberal government's approach to foreign interference has been a failure. The Prime Minister decided to bring in a special rapporteur, which was a mistake. He should have launched a public inquiry. Now the appearance of bias is so strong that the special rapporteur can no longer continue to do his work. So will the Prime Minister do the right thing and remove 
the special rapporteur from his position and restore Canadians' confidence in our electoral system. Here, here. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, David Johnston is an eminent Canadian who has served this government and this country uh, for uh, decades. Uh, the reality is he was uh, appointed a number of times by uh, former Prime Minister Stephen Harper to important responsibilities, including to be Governor General of this country. And he has undertaken this responsibility and this task of looking at foreign interference and reporting back to Canadians with the seriousness uh, with which one would expect of him. It is unfortunate that uh, the opposition parties are choosing to play politics uh, around uh, this issue instead of actually standing up for Can The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. The Prime Minister knows that the appearance of bias is so strong in this case that Mr. Johnson cannot continue to do his work to restore confidence in the system. Notre motion demande. Our motion asks for the Prime Minister to remove Mr. Johnston from his position. It is entirely clear that these allegations of foreign interference are serious. Will the Prime Minister finally take them seriously and launch a public inquiry now? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, since 2015, we have taken these allegations of interference seriously. That is why we have instituted a number of mechanisms to fight foreign interference, and that is why we are counting on experts like Mr. Johnston and Mr. Rosenberg. That's what we're doing, and we are producing recommendations moving forward. We are taking this seriously, and we will continue to do so. We will continue to follow the facts and the intelligence, the intelligence that is gathered by our agencies. Thank you. For Thornhill. Speaker, the Liberal Prime Minister appointed a member of the Liberal Trudeau Foundation advised by a Liberal donor to decide whether to investigate Liberal Cabinet Ministers and Liberal staff about what they knew and when they knew it. But don't worry, another Liberal Trudeau Foundation member cleared the conflict. That's the story in Ottawa. Canadians say it's not good enough. Conservatives say it's not good enough. Even the NDP is making a half attempt at appearing to say that it's not good enough. It's not good enough. It's a cover-up. How can you not call a public inquiry? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, the only cover-up that's occurring right now is the leader of the Conservative Party of Canada, who continues to cover his own eyes from the classified briefing that we offer him. And the irony, Mr. Speaker, is that a member of his own Conservative caucus, the member of Durham, at least took a briefing from CSIS. So now I say through you, Mr. Speaker, to him, take the briefing, learn the information, and do the work of fighting foreign interference together. Honourable Member for Thornhill. That minister will be remembered for silencing Canadians, and he will not silence yeah, this yeah. opposition. Yeah. David Johnson should not be the special rapporteur. He, there shouldn't be a special rapporteur. There needs to be an independent public inquiry, and it needs to happen today. The only thing that could possibly restore trust in this place is a real investigation into political interference, and the only people who believe that that shouldn't happen are these Liberals. I want to know from the minister, what will it take for him to listen to Canadians being harassed by a dictatorship, listen to the members of this House who were targeted? What will it take for him to end the cover-up? Yeah, yeah. The Honourable Minister. Speaker, if that member opposite had been paying attention, she would have noted that we did a public consultation on the creation of foreign agent registry by listening to Canadians, by working with diaspora communities to make sure that we understand their concerns around marginalization and stigmatization. And the best way forward is for the Conservative Party of Canada to take the briefing. So a simple question, Mr. Speaker, through you to them, when will you take the briefing? The Honourable Member for Edmonton, Mill Woods. Mr. Speaker, Beijing interfered in two federal elections and helped the Liberals win. They threatened members of Parliament of this House and their families. They donated $140,000 to the Trudeau Foundation to influence the Prime Minister's decisions. These are very serious matters of foreign interference that require a full public inquiry. Unfortunately, the, the Prime Minister, we all knew that the, the fix was in when the Prime Minister appointed a member of the Trudeau Foundation who also happens to be his neighbor and a longtime family friend, and then gave him a fake fancy title. Yeah. Why the cover up? Uh, okay. The Honorable Minister for Public Safety. 
Speaker, we've been taking the work of fighting against foreign interference very seriously <laughs> since 2015. And again, the contradiction of the Conservatives who want to say they're taking this seriously, but voted against the new authorities that we granted our national security establishment to fight this scourge. The fact that they do not want to support taking a briefing so that they can equip themselves with the information to have a responsible, thoughtful conversation about this, I think lays to bear that they don't take it seriously. So again, when will you take the briefing? I, again, I want to remind the honourable members, we kind of let it slide doing it indirectly and it was kind of a, a grey zone. I'm going to ask the honourable members to ask through the speaker, not directly to them, even if they put a prefix on it. The honourable member for Edmonton, Mill Woods. Mr. Speaker, it's not only concerning that Canadian elected officials are being threatened, but Canadians who disagree with Beijing are also very concerned. The executive director of the Uyghur Rights Advocacy Project said Johnson's recommendations for hearings rather than a formal inquiry was shockingly disappointing. Yeah. Mabel Tung, chairwoman of the Vancouver Society in support of democratic movement, said it gives us feelings that we are not safe for speaking our minds wow. as Canadians. Mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker, this government is failing Canadians with their self-serving cover-up. What are they hiding? Yeah. The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, and I want to be clear, clear that we share the concerns of the diaspora community leadership uh, who is worried about being targeted by foreign interference. That's why we conducted a public consultation on the Foreign Agent Registry, and that's why we think that there are compelling, intelligent reasons why a public hearing will put the community at the centre of these conversations so that we can have a thoughtful way forward in the work to protect our democratic institutions and fighting against foreign interference. The Honourable Member for Megantic L'Erable. This has gone on long enough, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister's schemes to avoid a public inquiry are now very clear to everyone after seeing the report from the Special Rapporteur. What's so special about that Rapporteur? The Trudeau Foundation connection. Liberal donors. He's an old friend of China and the Prime Minister's family. Mr. Speaker, when will the Prime Minister finally put an end to this farce, fire Mr. Johnston, and start a public inquiry? The Honourable Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs. Mr. Speaker, what is actually clear to everyone is the lack of credibility of the Leader of the Opposition when he refused the government's offer to access sensitive information about this. He decided that he prefers to play petty politics on something as important as defending our democratic institutions from foreign interference. Instead of accessing the facts and being able to speak publicly in a manner that is consistent with the facts and not just throw around political partisanship, that's what is clear. And my colleague should be disappointed in his leader, the honorable member. Well, it's quite the contrary. Let's talk about the credibility of this government. On April 27th, the Minister of Public Safety said that the RCMP had closed Beijing's two police stations in Quebec. But then we learned that the RCMP had not asked the stations to close. And one of them on Montreal's South Shore received almost $200,000 from this government, Mr. Speaker. Ultimately, Mr. Speaker, is this Minister of Public Safety just a puppet for this Prime Minister's disinform disinformation? Who is pulling the strings of disinformation? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, as I have said on several occasions, the RCMP has looked into these activities of foreign interference and these, these alleged police stations. They will continue to investigate the matter with the tools that this government gave them, measures that the Conservatives opposed. They opposed the bill to give our security establishment. They opposed giving them the tools they need. The Conservatives should think about that. The Honourable Member for Trois-Rivières. Mr. Speaker, ever since we've known that there was Chinese interference in our election process, this government has been ask acting as though Parliament has nothing to say about the matter, and democracy only belongs to the Prime Minister. It's quite something to see that a majority of parliamentarians elected by a majority of the population have less weight than a non-elected rapporteur appointed by the Prime Minister, reporting only to the Prime Minister, and who is the PM's friend. When will the Prime Minister finally launch a public inquiry, as a majority of MPs in this House are asking for?
Le ministre. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, once again, we are disappointed but not surprised that the leader of the Bloc Québécois refused to be able to access the most sensitive information from our national security establishment. These documents could have given him a view of the facts on foreign interference. Now, I've been an opposition MP as well. I understand that sometimes it can be hard to face the facts, but in this case, the leaders of the opposition parties, including the leaders of the Bloc Québécois and the Conservative Party, did have the chance to access the facts, but they refused that opportunity because they prefer to play politics. The Honourable Member, what is the Liberal solution to cast light on foreign interference? To ask opposition leaders to read secret information that they can never speak about publicly. This Prime Minister already didn't want to keep the population informed, and now opposition leaders wouldn't be able to either. We need more transparency, not more opacity. More transparency and less sneaking and hiding. We need a public inquiry that will guarantee more transparency rather than a rapporteur who is neither public nor independent. What are they waiting for, seriously? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, with all due respect, public hearings are not the only way to show respect for the values of transparency. This government created NSAGOP. This government created other bodies that are examining the matter. There are many examples of how we can move forward with a national discussion in order to better protect our democratic institutions. And this government wants to work together with all members on this. The Honourable Member for Laurent Labelle. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals are saying that an inquiry wouldn't be effective because there is too much going on having to do with national security. But they did start an inquiry on Mararar. And they tell us that they've done concrete things to protect our election system. But since then, at least three opposition members have been threatened. They're telling us that we shouldn't play political games. But yet, they are not respecting the will of a majority of elected members. All, none of their arguments hold water. Why are they refusing a public independent inquiry? The Honourable Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs. Mr. Speaker, since we came to power in 2015, we have taken threats of foreign interference very seriously. We are the first government to have created a series of nonpartisan measures, specifically in order to strengthen our ability to respond to interference in our democratic institutions, but also to inform parliamentarians about threats and about the actions that the government is taking to fight those threats to our democratic institutions. I think that my colleague will be pleased to hear from her colleagues who are on those committees. Our folk. Mr. Speaker, many families, especially those who live in rural communities, have to drive out of necessity. They drive to school, to work, to medical appointments, to social activities. Families are already struggling with higher cost of living expenses. Now this Liberal government wants to add two more carbon taxes on financially stressed Canadians. The Liberal carbon tax one will add 41 cents a liter on gas. How painful does life have to get before this Prime Minister will finally cancel the carbon tax? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of the Environment. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And the Conservatives never want to talk about the costs of climate change. The Parliamentary Budget Officer uh, reported that there was a $20 billion impact to the Canadian economy in 2021, uh, Mr. Speaker. 600 fires are burning from coast to coast to coast, Mr. Speaker. They're devastating our communities. They're threatening lives and livelihoods. When are the Conservatives going to get serious about climate change and stop the denial, Mr. Speaker? The Honourable Member for Haldeman Norfolk. Mr. Speaker, I'll tell you about the cost of, of this carbon tax. It costs lower income Canadians the most. It is an unfair tax. Carbon tax, too, comes at a time when many Canadians are struggling just to feed themselves. Now, every time a Canadian fills up their car, they will be paying an additional tax on the GST and the HST. This Prime Minister is literally putting a carbon tax 
tax on a tax. When will this Prime Minister take his boot off the neck of Canadians and finally cancel carbon tax one and two? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And the Conservatives have no credibility when it comes to affordability, Mr. Speaker. Every time we put an affordability measure on the table, dental, rental, the Canada Child Benefit, what do they do? They vote against it. And the climate rebate, Mr. Speaker, is an affordability measure. It's going to help families be better off. But you know what's not going to leave families better off, Mr. Speaker? It's investing in cryptocurrency, Mr. <laughs> Speaker. And, Mr. Speaker, the, the Leader of the Opposition hasn't walked back his comments. He hasn't to apologize, Mr. Speaker, and that's because he has no plan for the environment, no plan for the economy, and certainly no plan for affordability. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Rocky Ridge. Well, Mr. Speaker, the Liberals already have one carbon tax that will add 41 cents to the price of a litre of gasoline. Carbon tax 2 will add another 17 cents per litre. Oh, GST no. will, of course, be applied to both. This means that the an extra 61 cents on the price of a litre of gas. Since Canadians can't afford higher taxes and the existing carbon tax has not achieved emission reductions, will the Liberals cancel this new carbon tax today? Get yeah. rid of it. The Honourable Minister for Immigration. Speaker, I would remind all members of this House that climate change is real. I came to Ottawa this morning from my home province of Nova Scotia, where some of our communities are literally on fire. There are thousands upon thousands of Nova Scotians who have been displaced from their homes, hundreds who are risking... I'm going to interrupt. I'm, I'm starting to have a hard time hearing the answers again, and I want to make sure that everyone gets to hear the voice of the person who's speaking and hear the message as well, whether it's from the question or the answer. So I'm going to ask everyone to calm down and not yell at people. Yeah, that's a good... Uh, whoever said shh, I agree with them. That's a very good point. The Honourable Minister, from the top, please. Mr. Speaker, I know that it is difficult for Conservatives to accept this, but climate change is real. I came to Ottawa this morning from my home province of Nova Scotia, where our communities are literally on fire. Thousands upon thousands of families have been displaced from their homes. Hundreds are watching as their homes may be turned into ashes. Eight months ago, Hurricane Fiona damaged our communities beyond measure, displacing not just homes, but sweeping people out to sea in some instances. Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives are peddling policies that they know will increase the level of pollution that is causing these severe weather events. We have one planet, Mr. Speaker. It is my home. It is yours. I will not stand idly by and watch it burn. The Honourable Member for Simcoe Gray. Mr. Speaker, the number one thing that people in my community contact me about is the cost of living. High inflation, mortgage renewal increases, and the carbon tax are punishing Canadians. In rural ridings like mine, there isn't a subway. People need to drive. A good government makes life more affordable. This government institutes a COVID second tax instead, or a co carbon. Carbon tax one will add 41 cents a litre. Carbon tax two will add 17 cents. And because they are Liberals, they'll tax the taxes and add GST. Is 61 cents a litre enough, or is there a third carbon tax? Yeah. The Honourable Minister for Natural Resources. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think most members of the House recognize the scientific reality that is climate change and the need to address it. But of course, we need to do so in a manner that reflects affordability. That's why we put in place the heat pump program, the grocery rebate, and others. I must say, though, that I find the positions being taken by the Conservatives to be increasingly bizarre. First, they run and are elected as MPs on a platform that acknowledges that the pricing of pollution is the most efficient way to reduce emissions, and now they repudiate their own platform. Now they criticize the clean fuels regulation, a policy very similar to the renewable fuels regulation that was introduced in 2010 by none other than Stephen Harper. Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives should start being honest with the Canadian public. The only thing they presently do that is constant is that they ignore the scientific reality of climate change and have no plan to build an economy for the future. The Honourable Member for North Island, Powell River. Mr. Speaker, Canadians are worried about the state of our democracy. Diaspora communities have been sounding the alarm 
for decades on this issue of foreign interference. This government is clearly not listening to them, and the official opposition is more interested in making political points. New Democrats are listening. We know 72 percent of Canadians want a public inquiry. They need to trust our democratic institutions. Will the Prime Ministers put the interest of Canadians first and call a public inquiry? The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, uh, we are confident that Mr. Johnston has laid a path forward uh, in holding public hearings that will put communities at the centre of a conversation in the way in which we can fight against foreign interference and protect our democratic institutions. And it is encouraging, Mr. Speaker, that at least the NDP are prepared to take the briefing. Uh, it is simply uh, up to the Conservatives now, if they are serious, to roll up their sleeves, get a seat at the table, take a briefing so that we can fight foreign interference together. Before going to the next question, I just want to remind the Honourable Member for Lee's Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes that he has a very strong voice and it carries very well. So if he's speaking to anyone, I'm sure he's only talking to the people around him, maybe just whisper to the best of his ability. The Honourable Member for Vancouver East. Foreign interference is real. It is happening here in Canada, and this Prime Minister has failed to address it. By refusing to implement an independent public inquiry into foreign interference, the Liberals are hurting people and our democracy. Their appointed rapporteur, David Johnston, does not have the confidence of this House. He must go. The Prime Minister needs to listen and do the right thing. Will he remove David Johnston and immediately launch an independent public inquiry? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, I share my colleagues' concerns about the threats that are posed by foreign interference, which is why this government has been acting concretely by introducing new powers for the national security establishment, by creating new mechanisms of transparency. Uh, most recently, uh, I signed off on a ministerial directive to ensure that I'm getting briefed, the Prime Minister is getting briefed, and we now have a public hearings process, which we hope to start in earnest, so that we can bring Canadians along as we equip our establishment with new tools, but to do so in the right way. And that is something that we are all committed to doing. Member for Vancouver, Grenville. Mr. Speaker, the overdose and toxic drug supply crisis is having a devastating impact on Canadian communities and families of all backgrounds from all walks of life. From Fort Mac to St. John's, from downtown Montreal to my own riding of Vancouver, Granville, the illegal supply laced with toxic substances is killing people. Mom Stop the Harm, a network of Canadian families impacted by substance use related harms and deaths, are on the Hill today to tell us that harm reduction saves lives. Don't believe it? Just ask anyone who's lost a loved one to tainted drugs. The Conservatives are suggesting a false choice between treatment and harm reduction, but you need both. What does the Minister of Mental Health and Addictions make of the Conservatives' absurd suggestion that harm reduction measures are contributing to the overdose crisis? Honourable Minister for Mental Health. Mr. Speaker, I thank the member from Vancouver Granville for his question and his determined advocacy on this issue. It's so important to listen to the families and loved ones with lived and living experience like Mom Stop the Harm. And so disappointing that the Conservative Party is pursuing a campaign of fear over facts and that the leader has refused to meet with this truly important group. Multiple experts have affirmed there's no evidence that prescribed safe supplies contributing to drug deaths. As the BC chief coroner was clear, there should be no dichotomy between access to life-saving safer supply and access to life-saving treatment options. There we go. The Honourable Member for New Brunswick Southwest. Mr. Premier. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Atlantic Premiers begged this government to remove the carbon tax from home heating fuels. But instead of listening, the Liberals have come up with carbon tax two that is going to punish Atlantic voters even more. Carbon tax one is a 40 cent a litre tax on pump prices. Carbon two acts adds another 17 cents. Plus, there's the 15 percent HST adding another nine cents to pump prices. This makes everything we buy more expensive. Yep. Carbon tax one and carbon tax two will add or cost Atlantic households an extra $2,000 a year. When will the Liberals stop punishing Atlantic Canadians and remove the carbon tax scam? Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Immigration. 
Speaker, my honourable colleague and I have something in common. Both of our provinces are on fire right now. The reality is, for eight years now in this House, every time we advanced a policy that would reduce emissions, the Conservatives voted against it. For goodness sakes, Mr. Speaker, one of the members of Parliament on the Conservative side from Nova Scotia have described investments in heat pumps as fairy tales. They won't get behind anything that protects our environment. The reality is, and the member knows this, Mr. Speaker, this policy puts more money in the pockets of families than it will cost them. He would take money from his neighbours to make pollution free. That is incredible policy. We will be there to make life more affordable. We will be there to protect our environment. That is the path forward. The Honourable Member for New Brunswick Southwest. Mr. Speaker, it is absolute rubbish that a carbon tax is going to control the weather or control or bring down national disasters. Yeah. This yeah. government is not serious about an environmental policy. It has a tax policy. 67 cents is what it's going to cost motorists in Atlantic Canada to fill up their pumps because of carbon tax one and two. And it is the, it is the parliamentary budget officer who says the net cost to Canadian families in Atlantic Canada is over $2,000 a month. So I ask again, when is this government going to do what Atlantic premiers have asked and to cancel the carbon tax two to give all Atlantic Canadians the break they deserve? The Honourable Minister for Families. You know what's costing Atlantic Canadian families right now? Are the forest fires in New Brunswick and exactly. Nova Scotia. Yeah. It's the That's fact right. that there are thousands of families across this country that have had to flee their homes. And instead of putting policies on the table that would help fight climate change, they're obsessed with trying to deny it and trying to ensure that Canadians don't have the tools that they need to fight climate change. Mr. Speaker, it's no wonder that the members opposite yesterday accused us of putting them on a guilt trip. They feel guilty for the fact that they're not doing anything to exactly. support Canadians in fighting climate change. Exactly. Thank you, Mr. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, as we speak, 1.5 million Canadians are resorting to food banks every month. One in five families have had to cut their food budget because they don't have enough money. As we speak, in order to help Canadians, this Liberal government decided to come up with another tax. The Liberal Carbon Tax 2.0. It's going to cost each family in Quebec $436 more, according to the PBO. Why is the Finance Minister imposing a new tax on Canadians? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we understand that for everyday people, for all Canadians, things are tough these days. And that's why our government has implemented programs to help Canadians with affordability. For example, the grocery rebate. And that money will be available to Canadians on July 5th. So I'm happy that all together we managed to stand together and pass that measure. Now we need to do it with other measures to help Canadians. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, what is for sure is that don't count on the Conservative Party to support the second carbon tax. It was bad enough they had one, but now they've got another, and it's going to cost $436 more to average Canadian families, and the Liberals are proud to say so. Well, I've got news for the Liberals. Could I just ask a simple question? Are they going to charge GST on top of the carbon tax and version one and version two? The Honourable Minister of Innovation. Mr. Speaker, I have a lot of respect for the member for Louis Saint Laurent. But you know what, Mr. Speaker? He should have listened. We listened to Canadians, and they said three things to us, Canadians did. And the, uh, the Conservatives should do this more often. They said, help us out with the cost of living. And that's why the finance minister came up with the grocery rebate, which will help 11 million Canadian families. The second thing people asked us to do, Mr. Speaker, was they said we need more health care. And that's where we took action. And the third thing was invest in the economy of the future, and that's precisely what we did. Before going to the next question, I'd like to remind members 
that just because they're looking in another direction when they're shouting, I can see them doing it. Just a little reminder. The Honourable Member for jean -Pierre. Mr. Speaker, in 2007, Commissioner Grenier tabled a report on illegal spending by Option Canada during the 1995 referendum. He found that the No Camp had more than half a million dollars in illegal spending from federal sources. The federal government refused to cooperate. This week, the National Assembly unanimously supported the release of the Grenier Commission documents. Even the Liberal Party. But the federal government's archival records will still be missing. Will the government now commit to full cooperation with the unanimous National Assembly? The Honourable Minister of Canadian Heritage. That is typical Bloc Québécois for you, Mr. Speaker. They're looking 35 years in the past to try to pick fights here. But this is the government of Canada, but they're using uh, squabbles, provincial squabbles, to try to pick a fight with the federal government. Could they just be a bit serious here? The Honourable Member for jean -Pierre. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, this is not picking. We're not looking to pick a fight. We're. This is. Uh, brings us back to official languages and the member for Mount Royal. Mr. Speaker, the half million in illegal spending revealed by the Grenier report is believed to have come from Heritage Canada. We'll never get to the bottom of this without Ottawa's cooperation. Almost 30 years after the fact, the National Assembly is of the unanimous opinion that that's enough water under the bridge. Today, all the information about the referendum can be released without damaging the reputations of those involved. Quebecers and Canadians, too, for that matter, have a right to know the truth. Will the government cooperate with the unanimous National Assembly? The Honourable Minister. They want the truth. Well, the truth is that the bloc has both feet planted firmly in the past. They can't look forward. They can't look to the future. All they can look, do is look behind them. They're, they're focused on other things. Well, we're focused on the economy, our seniors, and so on. We're not backward looking, Mr. Speaker. Four foothills. Scam with a second carbon tax, and Canadians are paying the price. In carbon tax one, drove up the cost of feed, fuel, and fertilizer, driving up the cost of food more than $1,000 per family. And higher carbon taxes means higher food bank use. Last year, more than 5 million families were using a food bank every month. With a higher carbon tax, the use of food banks has gone up a staggering 60 percent. More than 8 million Canadians are using a food bank every single month. To the Prime Minister, how many Canadians are going to use a food bank when you implement carbon tax 2.0? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, during this question period, we have heard a price on pollution described by Conservatives as rubbish and just now as a failed scam. Now, that's astonishing because every single Conservative MP was elected on a promise to introduce a price on pollution. This is what their platform said. We will assess progress so carbon prices can be on a path to $170 a ton. So when were Conservatives telling the truth when they were asking for votes or in the House today? The Honourable Member for Chatham, Kent Leamington. Mr. Speaker, it seems that the Prime Minister likes the carbon tax so much that he created a second one. Carbon tax one is already inflating the price of groceries, so it's going to cost a family of four more than $1,000 more for this coming year. Carbon tax two is only going to make that worse. Food bank use is already at record highs, with one in five families already skipping meals. And now, a family farm will face up to $150,000 more in taxes uh, by the time this carbon tax is through. When will this Prime Minister get the facts and stop the tax? Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Sport. Uh, we've done what an, a responsible government does. We've reduced pollution at the same time as we helped Canadians the most in need. That's what a responsible government does. They build the economy of the future while helping industry 
and Canadians deal with the higher costs, for example, with the grocery rebate. But the Conservatives are acting wholly unresponsibility, not only by voting against the budget with its specific supports for Canadians, but when are they going to be a bit more responsible on behalf of Canadians? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Now, Louvain. Carbon tax board is inflating the price of groceries, making it more expensive for families to put food on the table. Food bank use is at record high, and one in five Canadians are skipping meals. The average farm of 5,000 acres is going to be paying up to $150,000 for his first failed carbon tax. Wow. Carbon tax, too, is only going to make things that much worse, Mr. Speaker. Families cannot afford food. When will this jet-setting, out-of-touch Prime Minister finally realize the more he goes woke, the faster Canadians are going broke? Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Mr. Speaker, once again, our Conservative colleagues are using incomplete information. I'd like to remind everyone of everything we're doing to support our farmers, who are the first ones affected by climate change. We have a clean technology program for agriculture, which is about to open up uh, in June. So I would encourage farmers who are about to purchase equipment, who are d to dry their grain and so on. I encourage them to make use of that program. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Chateauguay-Lacolle. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Quebec's cultural community is in mourning. Yesterday, actor Michel Côté passed away. For decades, Quebecers have enjoyed his tremendous talent. He left his mark on many generations and achieved the remarkable feat of starring in television, theatre and film. On behalf of the Government of Canada, could the Minister of Canadian Heritage share a few words with us and remind us of Mr. Cote's impact on our culture? The Honourable Minister of Canadian Heritage, our sincerest condolences to the friends and family of Michel Cote. He was known for his humour, his sensitivity, his sincerity and his incredible talent with roles in Brew, Cruising Bar, Crazy and so on. He marked uh, generations of Quebecers. When you saw his name in the credits, you knew it was going to be a good uh, show. So. On behalf of all Quebecers, I'll be taking, I'll be having a beer in your memory. Great country. Mr. Speaker, after eight years of this Liberal government, violent crime is up 32 per cent. And just three days ago in my community, a notorious and violent repeat offender was arrested for a break-in just hours after his release from court. Wow. The RCMP revealed this man has generated 421 police files and has been charged with 64 offences since 2016, including assault. Our streets are more dangerous, and the Liberal bail legislation will still allow many repeat violent offenders to be released. So will this government take bail reform seriously and keep violent repeat offenders out of our communities? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Mr. Speaker, Bill C-48 targets precisely repeat violent offenders with weapons. Mr. Speaker, we've been working in close collaboration with the provinces since last October in order to come up with a bill that is not only charter compliant, Mr. Speaker, but also listen to concerns raised by police associations, raised by provincial uh, ministers of justice and, and public safety ministers. And we've come up with a bill, Mr. Speaker, that addresses those. Mr. Speaker, here's what the, the Canadian Police Association had to say with respect to that bill. We appreciate the ministers that work collaboratively with stakeholders and introduce this common sense legislation that responds to our concerns. The Honourable Member for Saskatoon University. This Liberal government has increased violent crime by 32 per cent in Canada. Last Wednesday, I had a ride along with the City of Saskatoon Police to see firsthand the, the mess that these guys have created in our streets. That night, I witnessed um, an arrest of an individual that had almost a dozen warrants out for her. Most are it's happening, and it's happening now on one side, then on the other side. 
I'm going to ask the honourable member to restart his question, and I want everybody to listen. And earlier there was something that was very sensitive, and I saw some people laughing out there, and I just want to point that out because it's very insensitive to do that. So please. Pay attention to what's being said so that we can all react appropriately. And by appropriately, I mean parliamentary appropriately, not what you might think is the proper response in your mind. The Honourable Member for Saskatoon University from the top, please. This Liberal government over the last eight years have driven up violent crime by over 32 per cent. Last Wednesday, I had the opportunity to go for a ride-along with the City of Saskatoon Police to see the mess that they've created in the streets. That night, I witnessed the arrest of an individual that had over a dozen warrants out for her arrest. Her most recent charge happened at a safe injection site where she took a utility knife to another addict and cut him from his ear to his mouth. Violent criminals should not be the Honourable Minister of Justice. Mr. Speaker, we have, we have used Bill C, introduced Bill C-48 precisely to address violent repeat offenders with weapons, including knives, Mr. Speaker, that was raised by Manitoba and other provinces. And Mr. Speaker, we've done that working in collaboration. Mr. Speaker, here's what the Saskatoon Police uh, Deputy Chief Cam McBride, who I'm sure is a friend of the Honourable Member, said about our, our new federal bail. He says it's a good move forward. Right. It's encouraging to see the voices of the community and policing across Canada being heard. Mr. Speaker, we have the support of the police. We have the support of, of provinces and territories here. The only person we don't have the support of is the leader of the opposition. The Honourable Member for Charbourg, Haute Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, after eight years of this Liberal government, violent crime has increased by 32 per cent. This should worry every member of this place because 32 per cent is a huge increase. Consider the case of Jonathan Gravel, sentenced to 20 months house arrest for rape. Clearly, this government has lost its way. But my question is, would the Prime Minister be willing to support a bill that would create an offence for parole violation and send violent criminals back to jail instead of putting them under house arrest? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Mr. Speaker, serious crime always warrants serious punishment. And that's why we're creating reforms to criminal law that are based on evidence, Mr. Speaker. Bill C-48, according to the Association of Chiefs of Police, they, that organization has said they are supportive of the effort, that it's a logical bill and it meets the needs and the concerns raised by the association's members. Canada has what the world needs, particularly in our ability to harness our natural resources to power the world. In Atlantic Canada, we have immense opportunities to utilize offshore wind to drive hydrogen and green ammonia production while decarbonizing our electricity grids. There needs to be regulatory certainty to ensure Canada can attract the capital at home and around the world. Can the Minister of Natural Resources speak to Bill C-49, which was tabled this morning, and the ongoing work he's doing with the governments of Nova Scotia and Newfoundland and Labrador to make sure that our region is the best in the world and can drive our energy future, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, my thanks to the member for King Hans for the question and his consistent advocacy on this file. Canadians expect their governments to accept the scientific reality of climate change and to take concrete action to address it, something that our colleagues across the aisle could learn. And they expect us to look to seize the... I'm going to, uh, the, I'm, I'm going to ask the Minister to start over. The uh, member for Costa Bay's Central Notre Dame has been shouting quite a bit. It's getting a little out of hand. I'm going to ask him to quiet down so that the Minister can start from the top, please. I want to thank the member from, uh, from King's Hands for the question and his consistent advocacy on this file. Canadians expect their governments to accept the scientific reality that is climate change and to take concrete and bold actions, something that our colleagues across the aisle could learn from. 
They also expect to, us to look to seize the economic opportunities that can be enabled through a transition to a lower carbon future. One such opportunity is offshore wind to produce electricity and to produce hydrogen. By 2040, the global offshore wind market is predicted to attract $1 trillion of investments. And our East Coast has some of the best resources in the world. Today, I was pleased to introduce the amendments to the Offshore Accord Act. The legislation are going to help her for Vancouver Kingsway. Yet another study once again proves public pharmacare saves our health care system money $1,500 per patient every year. It also reveals patients can't access medicine because of cost. This means more hospital visits, needless suffering, and billions of dollars wasted. New Democrats have pushed for public pharmacare for decades because we know it saves lives and money. And Liberals have promised this since 1997. Wow. Will the minister finally implement public pharmacare to keep our bottom line and Canadians healthy. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm, I'm, I'm pleased and grateful for that question. As a member knows really well, we're working together. I thank them for their partnership in keeping and supporting the hard work that we've done until now in increasing accessibility, increasing affordability, and increasing appropriateness of the use of drugs across Canada. We have put into place strong regulations a few months ago in bringing prices of patented medicine in Canada closer to what we want to see them across the world. We have also invested in a new Canadian drug agency and we'll be doing a lot more. The Honourable Member for Timmins, James Bay. It's an open defiance of its legal obligations to ensure health care for First Nation children under Jordan's principle. We have children in British Columbia who are now being denied therapy because the government refuses to pay the bills. We have speech pathologists in Northern Ontario who are facing bankruptcy this week because of the minister's policy of delay and denied payment for Jordan's principle. Without these treatments, these children's lives are going to be permanently impacted. This minister has been asked again and again to stand up for the children. Why? Why is she refusing to respect her legal duties under Jordan's principle? For Indigenous Services. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to be part of a government that prioritizes access for care for children all across this country. Indigenous children are receiving care by the hundreds of thousands of products and services as a result of the action this government has taken. In respect to the provider that the member opposite is speaking about, that member now has a dedicated service provider in the department working to ensure that invoices are correctly submitted and remitted uh, in payment as quickly as possible. Thank you. I'm afraid that's all the time we have for question period today, c'est tout le temps, I wish to draw the attention of the members to the presence in the gallery of the Right Honourable Sir Lindsay Hoyle, Speaker of the House of Commons of the United Kingdom, who is accompanied by one of the Deputy Speakers, the Right Honourable Nigel Evans. Yeah.